going on, everybody? Josh Lyles here, founder at Sales-CRM. I'm here with Mike Young. Mike's the vice president for GIX Logistics out in Nebraska. Mike, how are you doing today? Good, man. How are you? Doing pretty well. Can't complain. It's Friday. Happy Friday. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, Mike, how many? Let's just let's just go ahead and get right into it. How many years have you been in logistics, and why are you still in freight? <laughs> oh man, the, the second part of that question is probably deeper than the first part. So, coming up on <laughs> um, coming up on eighteen years total in transportation, two two and a half of that was um, at a fairly decent sized asset uh, trucking company, uh, and then the rest has been the rest has been at GIX. Um, we kind of, I kind of got in at the right time. I think, I think timing. Uh, maybe two reoccurring themes in my career have been timing and who who I know versus what I know. <laughs> um, but uh, so I got in. I got in at GIX when they were, were really really small and kind of um, um, figuring out how to grow and how what what that should look like or what they wanted to do. And so, um, and they were doing a big software upgrade, and I had. Um, previous experience with doing this exact same software upgrade. And so it kind of gave me a, an inside track. And um, I was able to, at the time we were combined with our, our sister company, our fleet, and it gave me an opportunity to bounce around and see all the different departments and, and probably more so see how they didn't interact and how they maybe could be interacting and, and, and doing some different things to be more efficient department to department. To department. And then, um, just how their focus was, what they what they were focused on, and, and the the asset the asset company I came from, um, there was really no there was really no uh, kind of BS at this company. It was like very like mm -hmm. this is like we are here to work, we are here to do this, we are here to do this, we are here to do this, and and uh, I got over to to GIX and, and Grand Island Express, and it was a little laid back, and and I was actually surprised with how many you know, how their, their fleet size and how many people they had supporting that and, and how much, how much freight they weren't necessarily, um, moving through their brokerage given the number of people they had. And so, uh, I was, I was, um, a broker for a few months and then, uh, and then I helped with the software upgrade or implementation. And then, um, after the software was done, I, I took like a caliper test would be now would be like a Clifton strength finder or something like that. It was like a personality test. Uh, test it out and they said, Hey, you should go into sales. And so I sold for both sides of the company for three or four months. And then, um, after doing that, they decided, Hey, we want some fresh blood running the brokerage. Um, I don't really know what they were thinking. I was 24, man. I didn't know. I didn't know what I was doing that weekend, much less what I was going to do for the rest of my career. And so they're like, Hey, you want to run the brokerage? And I'm like, yeah, I'll run the brokerage. why not? That was absolutely, uh, in over my head and, and, uh, one of those moments where I'm, I knew I was going to kind of learn on the fly and figure it out. And, um, when I took the brokerage over, it was July of 2009 and, um, we were seven people doing about $6.8 million in revenue. Um, and then we, um, we grew a little bit just by, just by me saying, Hey, we're going to work a little harder. We're just going to do a little bit more. Uh, we're going to take that extra load. We're not going to, we're not going to look at the clock and go, well, it's 359. Do I want to book that extra load? Yeah, you want to book the extra load. And we're just going to put more effort towards what we're doing. And we saw load count and, and a little bit of staffing kind of incrementally grow. And then uh, in 2014, we decided to split the two companies. Um, and when we split, we, we brought 12 people with us to our new office. Um, and uh, so 12 people in 2014. And then in 2016, we had grown to about 38 um, we had filled up the office in the first floor of the building that we're currently in, in Grand Island, Nebraska, moved everybody to the second floor. Um, and now we're at, now we're at 86. We had a high water wow. mark of, of kind of the mid nineties, 90, 95. Um, but we're hovering right at 86, obviously in 20, 21, 2022, we kind of had our, our, our record years, um, about 150 million in, in revenue and, and, um, so the growth has been fun. That's, it just creates all these challenges and, and new experiences. And, and, um, your question about why, 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 why have I decided to say it's right. It's, I asked my staff all the time, we'll have a meeting, we'll have, we'll be in a, we'll be in a conference room and we'll go to make some big process change or policy change or requirement, or, Hey, we need to do this way different. And how hard do you think that's going to be? And 
they'll kind of look at me like, how do you know this is what we're supposed to do? And I'll kind of shrug my shoulders and go, I don't know this is what we're supposed to do. This is what I think we need to do. And the reality of it is, is, you know, raise your hand if you've ever ran a $150 million company and nobody raises their hand, including me. And so we all get to learn how to do this as we go. Um, you know, I don't know that running a $150 million company is much different than running an $80 million company or a $75 million company. Once you kind of get past that 50 million mark, it is, um, you just got to keep rolling your sleeves up and, and know, doing what you know works and, and figuring it out. But um, that has been a go-to go to phrase of mine. It's like, okay, well, who's ever ran an $80 million company? Nobody? Okay, me too. So how do we figure it out? Let's, 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 we're going to try it. And if it doesn't work, we can roll it back and we'll go back to the drawing board and we'll figure out what does. And um, I think that maybe is the answer to your last part of the question. It's that piece of it. It's that challenge of how do you keep going and how do you keep countering all of the things that can go wrong? There are way more things that can go wrong in our industry than can actually go right. And you, that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. That's the puzzle. That's really interesting. Um, I, I, I guess just even from uh, one, I, I've got a multitude of questions, I think based on, on all that, but so you've been there from essentially 6 million to 150, right? Yep. So, you know, some, I, I feel like I see a lot of conversation around getting from zero to 10 million, 10 to 50, 50 to a hundred, a hundred to, you know, 200. And I know you guys are in the middle of that. Is there, is there any of those ranges that stick out to you as they were the most difficult or was it just organically unique challenges, you know, along the way? Was there like, what would you say was the more challenging time period between those? Yeah. I think the hurdle from about 20 million, um, 18 million, 20 million to that $50 million, maybe even not 50, 45, high $40 million mark was probably our most challenging. And the reason for that is because you, you're really, in my opinion, you're going from quote unquote small. Um, and it doesn't take, you know, if you go look at like, you know, minus the big guys, the, the huge guys in our industry, when you get, when you get to like number five, number eight in our industry, the differences between eight and nine are like one good month, right? Mm -hmm. it's between 10 and 12, or it, it's like a good quarter. And so when you, when you start talking about that, you go, okay, well, we just made a $20 million increase uh, from, from where we were. Maybe that took a year or two years or 18 months or whatever, because we were growing rapidly. Um, and it wasn't, it, you know, I think a lot of times you see a brokerage grow, it's like, well, you've had a lot of bodies. Have you had a lot of business? And we were adding business and bodies at the same time. And that, that conversion went from like, okay, well, to, to get over 50 million, now you have to start working with some companies that have requirements from a tech standpoint, from a mm -hmm. process standpoint, from a coverage standpoint. We had to double up an after hours position. We had to be staffed 24 seven. We had to figure all those things out kind of in that range. And then once that, those hurdles were done, it was like, okay, well, from 50 to 80 was, it was one, it was easier and quicker than 20 to 50. And Interesting. I think that that's, that, that was the hurdle. Cause once you, you start, you start playing around kind of with some of the, the bigger, the bigger players in our, our industry and some of the bigger shippers and bigger customers in our industry, and they have different requirements and different expectations. Uh, and you have to be ready to meet those if you want to take that next step. So. Yeah, I would say that 30 million run uh, easily was our most difficult. Yeah, and you, it's it's hard to also like consider all the little moving parts that sort of organic. I, I feel like I guess they just come up along the way, right? Like you talk about the 24 seven stuff, that, you know, probably weekend tracking or weekend updates or, you know, yeah. booking of loads and yeah. stuff and after hours. I mean, I feel like that comes up every now and then. But as you grow and if you put in that more effort, like you're talking about of 359, you know, need to get an extra one. Yeah. Well, a lot of the top ones are doing that stuff, you know, past certain points. And I think from my experience in brokerage, it's, you know, when you look back at, or at least I look back at some of the operations and the sales reps, you know, when you're on team emails and being able to see that activity, that activity is going on, especially for the top ones there. It's tw it feels 24 seven. It's all the time. It is all the time for us. So it never stops. You'll come in and I'll have, I have almost, this is kind of crazy. I would bet. And some of this is, is as we've gotten bigger, it's been kind of my, uh, I guess, removal from frontline stuff during the day kind of. So my email traffic has slowed down a little bit during the day, but I, so I probably get as many emails overnight as I do during a normal work day, just from watching what's happening at night and seeing mm -hmm. how voice, you know, 
we, our phone system dumps voicemails into a bucket. They have to be kind of gone into and distributed and, and, and we need to make, Hey, did you handle that? Did who, who handled that? And, and the night shift, we've got a customer service side and, a, and an op side of our night shift. They are constantly communicating. Like, did you handle that? Did I, I'll, I'll get to it. Hey, I'm already calling this person back and you're seeing all of this interaction go back and forth. And you're like, Holy cow. Like what, you know, it is, it's crazy. And it is really is, it really is a 24 seven business. And it, I think that's one of the shocking things for some of the people that we bring in. It's like, Hey, do we get, um, do we get black Friday off? Like, no, <laughs> no, you don't. I mean, you can take it off, but you don't get, just get it off. Yeah. And so it's like, we, we got to keep going. We're, we have a skeleton, you know, we basically run half, half staffed, um, on Thanksgiving day. It's like, it's just, mm-hmm. that's what you have to do if you're going to compete in this industry. Yeah. And, and kind of from my recollection too, from being in it, those holiday times and everything, especially if you're talking about picking up new customers. I mean, one, you know, holiday season's already crazy in itself, but that is a time where a lot of people want to take time off and they are taking time off. So for those that are kind of willing to just, you know, take, just dig in for a little bit, that could be a time where somebody's there, they've taken the break. You can step up because that's a big part of freight, right? Is just yep. who's, who's going to be there for you when you need the support and you need the help. And I think that's kind of one of the unique situations of it is it, it, it's, it's a, maybe a, a risk and or a sacrifice is the more of the right word, not risk, but just sacrifice of more time with the family or whatever it may be. And being like, yeah, Hey, I got to send to this I, email. I think it's a risk. I, th- I think you're, I think you're, you're on the right track there because I think, you know, you're, you're going to go take shots at stuff. And, and I think that's the, you know, that's the scary part for, for some brokerages to take that next step is, is you've got to go take a, like, and, and you've got to go take a shot and then you cannot fail on it. And what means, what I mean by not, cannot fail on it, that your risk is the financial risk of having to cover that load. Mm-hmm. That's the financial risk The the other risk you run is that you get an opportunity from a customer, um, you know, if, if you're going to over, and we, we are guilty, we are guilty. We've done, we do this. We still do it. We will over promise and no, and, but we will make sure that we also over deliver. So it's like, yeah, we probably shouldn't have taken, we probably should have taken two of those loads and not five of those loads. But now that we take, now that we t- they've taken five, we got to cover the other three and that's our financial burden to bear. And so, you know, we look at that and we go, okay, wait. so the risk there is it's not, everybody talks about risk, like mitigating risk. Mm-hmm. We're mitigating risk too. But what we mean by that is we're just measuring it. All we're doing, all we're doing is measuring, is this worth committing to three more loads than what we think we should take on a Friday night, knowing that someone's going to cover them. Mm -hmm. And so it might as well be us. And the best case is all three cover really seamlessly, really easily. And we make money on all, all three of the extra loads. Worst case is we make money on the first two and the three that we overcommitted to, we end up having to cover at our cost. Customers, none the wiser. Trucks still show up on time. Trucks, trucks still deliver on time. Customer loves it. Maybe they'll lean on us the next time they need us. And maybe we can talk about a different rate the next time. But it's not, it's not us avoiding risk. When we, when you hear mitigation, I always feel like, oh, you're just avoiding risk. We are, we are weighing it, measuring it. Is it worth it? And you have to take the risk. And we have to take them. And if you don't want to take them, that's okay. But that's really not going to get you from 20 million to 50 million or whatever the number you're trying to do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, to take on the risk of, you know, are you going to be able to get enough trucks in that area for all three or however many loads that it may be, you know, could be a tight market or just a tough spot to come out of. But that's the, that's the risk that you take to try to earn the business and then keep it, you know, as time goes on to prove your service. Exactly. So, yeah, I guess it's just the, the roll of the dice that you take every time. Um, so I w- want to ask one question just in regards to, you know, your journey and, and sort of what you've learned along the way. And then we'll transition to some of the sales questions. But what is something, what's something that you've learned, mistakes that you've made? And let's just say, you know, okay, you've gone from six to 150 million, but if you had to start back from scratch at the six million oh, or even below that, what is one of the bigger mistakes that you've made that you would do differently if you had to restart? I think um, we've really done, all, we've, <laughs> my, my staff would like, if they see this, they're like, yeah, we have. <laughs> um, we really have adjusted and tweaked our compensation package a lot. And it's been a constant fight to try to right fit it 
and, and make sure that, you know, are we, are we compensating at the right times? Is it, is it enough? Is it too much? Is it, is it disproportionate? Is the compensation disproportionate to the revenue generated either way, plus or minus? Um, and I, <laughs> this is going to sound crazy, but I really took, I, I, it took about 14 years, honest to God, it took about 14 years for me to look at our comp package and go, this is as rock solid as I think we can have it. And, and the, and the, the secret to comp packages is you have to know going in that there is nothing is bulletproof. Mm-hmm. There is always a leverage point. Uh, if you're hiring smart people, like we all hire, you have to hire smart people in this industry. They're going to figure out what those leverage points are and they're going to, and they're going to do, and they're going to use them. And so it, it really, if I could go back, I would, I would look at, I would, I would have really, I, we took a lot of time developing them, even as we were changing them. And, and it's just been a constant evolution over the course of this time. But um, I wish I had, I wish I, you know, there's no way for me to know what I know now then, but I wish that's the part that I would have, I could have been sharper on, or I wish I, I could have had a better, my hands around it a little bit more. Um, Cause it just would have made everything much smoother. It would have just, there's less change this is it. This is what the right. expectations are. You know what to expect as an employee. Um, Cause those conversations are really hard. Like, Hey, we're tough. Okay. And it's just, those are extremely difficult conversations to have. So yeah, I think that's one thing that we feel like we're in a really, really good spot on right now. Um, that maybe we could have been at, at an earlier, at an earlier point. Mm-hmm. Well, that's great. Cause I know comp plans. I mean, that can be, if not, what it's, I think it is one of the top reasons that sales reps will often leave companies and venture off to potentially do their own thing or, yeah. you know, just explore different avenues within freight. So I know, I know that it can be a challenge for context for those that may be listening, just in regards to the model that you guys are between split model, cradle to grave. What does that look like for you guys? Certainly split model. We, we, um, uh, we have a sales, sales group, customer service group, operations group, um, so we want our sales reps to be lightly customer facing after, after the close, uh, we would much prefer that our customer service reps are the quote unquote day to day face. Uh, okay. but when we go travel, when we go to a conference, we go on a customer visit, um, it is the sales rep going. We have recently started sending the main customer service rep with the sales rep as well. And that seems to really, really benefit uh, everybody. But, um, yeah, it's a it's a model that has worked for us. We've never ever been cradle to grave. The closest thing we were ever to cradle to grave was when we had the broker just as the customer service rep as well. And that was kind of all a smear. We've okay. always had sales reps over the top um, on all of our accounts. So, got it. And then transitioning to some of the sales questions here. So you said you started off as a broker, and it sounded like you were on both sides, asset side, and then just on the brokerage side, non assets. Correct. Yeah, so I was hired to be on the non-asset side as a broker. All of my previous experience was as a dispatcher um, and customer service manager, kind of customer service rep. Um, and um, was in that role for a short time, and it was wild, man. Like from coming from the fleet side, where it's like everything's everything's tracked. I know where every truck is. Right. Uh, I can I can talk to them in a, in a text message or, or, or free form message format. Um, I remember I booked my first load. I was sitting next to the guy that was training me and I booked my first load and I was like, yeah, okay. Yeah. Be there then. And I hung the phone up and I like, as soon as the phone clicked, I was like, whoa, now what? I looked looked at him and he said, well, you just got to start working on the next load. And I was like, yeah, but how do I know where the, what this, he's like, no, he'll do what he's supposed to do. I was like, but how do I know that? I just had so much visibility and then you go. You go to the complete opposite, kind of, you know, whatever, 15, 16 years ago. And it's like, there was no GPS tracking for outside carriers. There was, there was none of that, right? So it's just like, yeah, okay, I'm just going to hang the phone up and hope that you're going to go pick that load up like you told me. So uh, I was in that role, switched over to the asset side for a little bit for the software piece and uh, some efficiency stuff. And then and then uh, went into a sales, a sales role for both sides of the company. I was selling fleet and or selling asset and non-asset. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so since you're, you're really involved in, you know, growing, scaling the team from what you guys have been able to do, is there 
specific traits that you're looking for when you're going through the hiring process? I mean, I know before we press record, we were talking a little bit about you guys being active with the university systems that are near the three locations that you guys have and whatnot. But have you found common traits that, hey, these things work for salespeople within freight. These also just don't look for salespeople in freight. And are you guys taking that into consideration in the recruiting hiring process? Yeah. So I think one of the biggest things that we found, I mean, other than you want people that like have a, you know, they're going to show up on time and they get, they have a, they have a certain level of work ethic and, um, and, and they, they, um, they're, they're intelligent. You want coachable. We, we want all those things, but <laughs> it's like a secret almost feels like, but yeah, <laughs> what, what, the one thing that we have noticed about super successful people in our company and maybe marginally or less successful people in our company is that the super successful people have been through something. They have been through something beyond what any of us would consider, you know, normal. They, 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 um, uh, one of our, one of our best brokers, um, brokers almost fell out of, fell out of school and they had to work their way. I mean, I mean, they were like this close and they had to work themselves all the way back just to graduate. And when they told us that story, in the interview, I was like, that type of work that it takes to recover from a mistake like that, or from like, that is, that is an incredible amount of work. There's nothing that we're going to do at GIX. that's going to be more challenging than that. Uh, one of our, one of our best sales reps that's, that's moved on and now is a really, really, really successful, uh, financial advisor. Um, he gave up his football career, his college football career to donate bone marrow to a complete stranger like just derailed his entire football career. It was like that, cause I, I need to do that. Well, that's mm -hmm. something that like that decision that he had to make, that's nothing. Spent that's years nothing playing football. Yeah. That's nothing compared to anything. He's going to have to experience it at, um, at GIX. And so you go down the list of all the people that are in all the spots for us and our on floor leadership and every single one of them has had something not quite go to plan not quite go their way. They've kind of had to pick themselves back up. They've had to figure it out themselves. Uh, they've had to get back on track and none of that. So like when you, you're a sales rep and you've got, you've gone through, your parents got a divorce when you, when you were younger and you grew up in a single parent household and you had to fight through that, or you, you, um, went through something, um, traumatic at a later, at a later age in your teenage years or whatever it might be, you go through something like that. Hearing no on a sales call doesn't really derail your day. There's mm -hmm. much, much worse things than a prospect telling me no when you've gone through some of the things that are, are really, really high performers, top performers have gone through. So that would be uh, our one of our former recruiters. <laughs> she always said that GIX like shops in a scratch dent in Ding Isle. Like when we're recruiting, like we're, looking for the, <laughs> we're looking for the kids that are a little nicked up, a little beat up. And because they're the ones, if you're standing in front of me at a career fair, uh, or, or in a classroom that I'm giving a presentation to, and you've had to go through that and you somehow still manage to be where you're at. That's somebody that I want working for me. That's really unique. I don't think I've specifically spoken with anybody about like, yeah, getting over some kind of triumph or back against the wall kind of situation. I think that's, that's pretty unique. Yeah. Um, so just. I guess talking about sales, you know, a lot of this kind of spurred from one of the posts that you had. And, and to me, it was there, there was a lot to unpack. I read it over a few different times and I'm like, OK, there's there's a lot of stuff here. And I, and it's some topics that I'm, I'm passionate about and love talking with people about obviously running sales dash. It's a sales system and people are managing and streamlining their sales process in it. Um, and I, at the end of the day, it's just kind of the world that I live in. Um, let's just, you know. I don't even want to get into the whole narrative around cold calling being dead and all that stuff, because those people, I think, especially like uh, that may be the case potentially in other industries. I, I, I don't think that'll ever be the case. You know, I'll say personally, I'm one of those people that believes all, all kind of sales channels work. It just depends on your volume and how skilled you are at those channels. Um, but just in general for you guys at GIX, how important are cold calls to your team? Well, I mean, that's what's got us our business. I mean, that's what's got us our business. But the um, it's what, what's what's pro pro propelled our growth. Um, I don't think it's sale. I don't think it's cold calls. Though I think it kind of goes back to the 
post I made on LinkedIn. I don't know that it's sales calls, the cold calls themselves. It's the manner in which we handle them. It's how we mm -hmm. plan for them. It's how we cater the, the call. It's how we uh, approach the prospect. It's, how, it's, it's the manner in which we do the cold calls that make the cold calls important. Um, and so if we aren't doing them, I, you know, and I think I messaged you, I said, I don't understand how you get new business if you weren't doing them. I don't, I don't understand it. I, and if there's somebody out there that can be in our industry that can grow, have the growth as we've had or similarly, and again, this is all organic. We didn't go buy somebody. We didn't go acquire somebody. We didn't merge. All of that was built on calls that we made. All of that was built on developing relationships with prospects and turning them into customers and winning, winning business off of bids and winning, winning quotes that we've earned through cold calls. Um, I just don't, I just don't know how else, I don't know how else we would have done it. I, I, mm -hmm. I cannot, you know, and maybe I'm just have a blind spot because it's the only way that I've known. Maybe there's like some, I don't know. I don't know what there is, but um, cold calls are a huge, a huge part uh, of what we of what we do and, and what we have to keep doing. And, and, and some of that management, some of that sales management piece is how do you manage the frustration of your sales reps? How do you manage the rejection that your sales reps experience? Cause we, on average, I, it, 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 grading average right now over the last 10 months is hard, but over the last 10 years, if we grade average, we have about a 30 to 35% success rate, right? When we, and when I say success, I think that there, I, I, I consider there being like kind of four closes. There's okay. the idea that you get to talk to somebody and develop a rapport with that person. That's close one. Close two to me would be the opportunity to quote business or provide a price. Close three would be you actually book a load, like you actually get something booked and, and we've got something tangible and we're going to build that customer for it. And then step four is like, or close four is like, just ongoing. You're always closing. Continuous. Right? Great. Like it's just continuous. Just that and really, really good, solid customer service on the back end, making sure that as a sales rep, what I told the customer, the broker knows what I told the customer. They have to back that up. The sales rep or the, the customer service rep has to back that up. Um, but you have to we have we've had to kind of carve out different ideas of what what a win is. And, and to me, um, getting traction with somebody, getting somebody to give you a really, truly honest response, whether it's on a phone or an email and how you handle that response, that is how you manage a cold call, right? I sent you my e I sent you an email or I made a phone call. I left you a voicemail, whatever it is. It got a response from you. Now, did, as a sales rep, did you shut up and listen to what the response was? Or are you just onto the next step of your sales process? Did you actually read what the prospect said? And, and can you take into account the information they're giving you and, 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 um, you know, be, um, empathetic towards what the, the spot they're in. Hey, I'm, we're down 12% year over year. I don't have room to go add another broker. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not actually asking for you to add me. I am asking for that. That information is great. That's the information that I was looking for. Now I know how to pace out this contact with you. I don't want to, I don't want to bug you. I appreciate the honesty. I appreciate the transparency. You're trying to keep your incumbents fed and happy. I don't want to, I don't want to impede on that. And that, and, and you might, there might be some really big brokerages that see this Josh and they go, that's not the way we do it. And that's fine. Correct. That's fine. That's the way we do it. And the reason we do it is because I'd rather have a long-term relationship with that person than drive them mad by, and also drive my sales rep mad by making them ask a question that we already know the answer to. I already know you're going to tell me no if I push anymore. So why am I going to push and put you in an uncomfortable situation as a prospect, frustrate my sales rep as a sales rep, when I know that we can just say, hey, you know what, as things get a little busier and as we see things turn, I'll probably going to touch base with you again. That's mm -hmm. easy. And I can always go to the next call. There's always somebody else to call. There's always another lead, another prospect to go after. So go fill your time with the, with with somebody that might have a greater need than that than that prospect um, than that current prospect does. So it's good stuff. I the 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 four closes thing is is unique. Um, on that topic, so you mentioned like building rapport, quoting pricing, first load, you know, continuing to move freight as the fourth. Do you guys 
celebrate, bring acknowledgement to the first two. And the reason why I'm asking this is because I'd had a conversation months ago with a sales rep and he's just like, look, it's tough. Like what we do is really, really challenging, obviously. And when you're making cold calls and stuff, and this rep was just talking about how sometimes it's hard to stay motivated at an organization where they may only be looking for just the shipments revenue margin, which I get that's the end result, right? For a salesperson, even just getting to the point where you actually got somebody on the phone to build rapport with them, like you mentioned that as the first close is a big deal for them because it can be hard to get people on the phone, right? And to get the time of day. Oh, you're fine. My lights. Anyway, <laughs> I can. No, I can still see. Better. We need to do better on that. On that case, like in in that perspective, in that perspective, and and that's something that, just in the in the recent struggles of our industry, right? It's like turning on new business and growing and doing what we need to do. That is something that the, the kind of the foreclose idea is the idea. Of like, how do we start celebrating any sort of win? Just any win, anything that we're getting traction on. How do we how do we start acknowledging that? And so it is something that we need to improve upon and acknowledge it and, and recognize it, um, and something that we need to make part of it. I mean, there's a there's a small celebration between me and the sales rep, right? Like, hey, look at this email I got. And I was like, that's awesome. Keep doing what you're yeah. doing. What what are you going to respond back with? What are you going to do? And so there, that happens between. Uh, them and I, but but it needs to maybe be broadcast a little bit. Hey, we're hey broker. It even helps the brokers, right? So volumes down a little bit. Things are a little slow. There's the light. Sorry, volumes <laughs> down. Uh, the volumes down. It's a little bit slow. And now the brokers, you know, if you're outwardly acknowledging, like, hey, we're talking to talking to this customer, especially if it's like a name, a brand, a shipper that everybody would know. Uh, there's one, there is one that we were talking to right now that everybody would know that we were honestly surprised we got a response from and like that needs to be broadcast company wide. Like we're like this, mm-hmm. we're this close and, and, and we're getting traction with this type of an account. This is coming. Keep, you know, keep working, keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. You're picking up your sales rep. We need to be better about it. We're not, we don't do a good enough job of that yet, but. In that in that situation with that shipper that you're talking about that everybody would know, how many approximate touches would you guess that that, that rep had done before they actually got that response? I'm going to tell you this, and it's going to sound really dumb because I believe that it like there was numbers thrown out of the TIA like 17 to 30 or something crazy, and 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 that's probably not crazy. When I say crazy, it just seems is when you put a number on it, you don't actually realize sometimes how many times you're attempting. Mm-hmm. Right? Like it's just like, yeah. this, this is what I do. Hey, on Wednesdays, <laughs> this is my list I, I have to reach out to. I have to, I have to try to get in contact with. For this sales rep and that brand name that everybody would recognize, I think it was twice is all. And she just got lucky. Oh, really? She, yeah. And, and, and she just hit a home run with how she, how she approached it. She, I think timing was good. Uh, yeah. I think that there was a few, there's a few, um, there's a few tech partners that we partner with that she mentioned one of those tech partners in that, in her mm-hmm. approach. Um, and I think that caught their eye. And so I think that, I think that it was, it was, it was, it was really good timing, fortunate timing, but, um, I would say on average to go get a really like a quote unquote, big shipper national type of brand. Um, oh man, I, at least six months, it's at least six months of work. Um, yeah. maybe, and maybe even a year, even in a good market, it can be that long for us. Yeah, I had heard those numbers thrown out at TIA as well. And I mean, I, I, I don't know what the exact number is. And there, I think there there is going to be the situations where it can take two. Like one yeah, call closes are a thing. It's just a super yeah, minute hardly number. Ever happens. And- hardly ever happens. Yeah. And I mean, timing is just such a, a hard, it's a hard thing to guess because it. I, I think the one thing that people overlook when it comes to sales is like sometimes it depends on the time of day and just like the day that you call that person oh, man. like they could have had just a terrible day family stuff going on or just everything's going wrong at work or you may have just called them at the time where they're just in a really happy mood and things are just going well and that that's just part of the game but that's the reason why you it have is. to make the calls and you know make the dials shoot the emails off because that that's a real situation that happens yeah it was crazy and and that's not typical that is not a that's not typical but on that exact one um, yeah, I think it was, I think it was her second, second attempt. That's pretty awesome. So just a, I guess a couple more things I wanted to touch on quick. Um, so in the post that you made, uh, you, you talked a little bit about just like the goal, not being right now and being okay with that. Like if, even if it's six plus months out, you kind of alluded to that a little bit. 
uh, in uh, one of the questions just from a few questions ago, how for a salesperson, right? Because you even said, hey, bigger brokerages, they may not even accept that. And honestly, from everything that I've heard, a lot of the they bigger don't. brokerages probably would not accept that. Yeah. How do you try to instill that patience though into a salesperson, right? Because those relationships can be well worth it. And telling somebody to buckle up for six plus months, it's hard for a salesperson that needs to show results and, and get stuff in now. But how do you guys as an organization and as a team try to instill that patience in them to say, hey, play this for the long game? Yeah, so we do a lot. Of, I mean, we're we're coaching constantly. And I think a lot of and that is something you hear, you know, I think it's something you hear in our industry. And I think our industry is unique in the fact that I think it probably one on one legitimate strategic coaching probably happens more often with employees than it does in other industries. But I do not think that it happens on our industry to the extent that it is stated that it happens. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, Jags, it does. And and it, we are we are somewhat rigid with it. I mean, we are obviously, if you're not at your desk or you're on vacation, but we are, we are, um, pretty, pretty damn consistent in our coaching. And so what that gives us the ability to do is that we get the opportunity to not, we're not just coaching the sales rep on your next approach. We're coaching the sales rep emotionally, mentally, like it's like, Hey, you're doing really good. I'm seeing progress. Even if you don't feel like you're seeing progress. I can mm -hmm. see that I can see the improvements in your approaches. I can see the improvement in your in your quote numbers. I can see the improvement in how you're wording things and how you're how you how you look how many more questions you got answered in that call. Like we, we talk about that. We talk about exhausting a call. I don't know if anybody else says uses that phrase, but we call it exhausting a phone call. Did you get all of your questions answered? And if you got all of your questions answered and at the end it was no, then it was always gonna be no. But you got all of your questions. The worst thing you can do is get on the phone and get somebody that actually answers and maybe wants to talk. And because you're so nervous or you're, you weren't ready for them to answer that you didn't get all your questions answered. So how do you, how do you, did you exhaust the call? And so those are little tiny wins. And, and so a lot of the coaching is not, not just how do you leverage time of year, how, how you leverage what's going on in market, not how you leverage the, the customer's needs maybe, but how do you, how do you leverage the mental and emotional state of your sales rep? And if you're not, yeah. if you're not consistently talking to them and I don't mean in passing, I mean, consistently sitting down and having conversations with them and to help them with that and to help them understand that, Hey, there's been times where I'm like, they are based out of, they are based out of, uh, you know, Florida. There's not even a point in calling them until produce hits and that, you know, they have a need. Cause they're going to tell you for the remainder of the year, they don't need, I don't, I've got care. I've got trucks coming out of my ears down in Florida during the winter. I do not need help getting my product out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Then why waste that call? Why go purposely frustrate yourself making that phone call to somebody that you know does not need your help. And so that's something that we really, we really work on. Um, and so how often do you guys, how often do you guys just on that note really quick, talk about ICP and ideal customer profile with who you want to target? Um, that's interesting. We don't necessarily, we don't necessarily like segment, segment like, like, like a prospect, but we, we will, we will, um, there have been like prospects that will pop up on a list. And we're like, I don't like, we're just not a fit for them. Like you're mm -hmm. just going to beat your head against the wall. And even if you do have an opportunity, we're going to maybe, up, we're, we're not going to be able to service it the right way. So we need to like move on, um, say thanks, but no thanks um, type of deal. So, um, but that comes through the coaching. And so maybe the reason we haven't necessarily had to do that, Josh, is because of how active we are with our reps. We just kind of are constantly helping them filter their lists. Um, but you, um, you made a, you made a, a comment about that I, the idea of like, well, you know, six months from now and, and, um, and I didn't quite answer that for you. What was I going to say? Um, just in idea, regards to the patience for a sales rep. Yeah. The idea of that is, is that we also have a night. My goal with my sales reps is I always have a nice mix. Like a, we need a nice mix. Like we've had sales reps get caught. It's like, okay, well, everybody on your list is like a, like a super big fish. So you're going to spend, like, you're not going to turn anything on new for a long time because 
you have to go through RFIs and you've got to go through inquiries. Corporate. You go, yeah, you got to go all this stuff. And so, and then you'll get to somebody else and it's like, well, I turned on this customer and they've got two loads a month. And I've turned on this customer and they get one load a month. And they've turned this mm-hmm. customer four loads a quarter. And it's like, you need to go after somebody a little bit bigger. Mm-hmm. Like you need to, you need to, you usually need to go up to the small guys. We want, we want those shippers. The relationships are better. The rates are usually a little bit better, but you need to start, we need, you need to start chasing a little bit of volume. And then you've got the other sales reps. You're like, you need to stop chasing so much volume and start intermingling some smaller customers. Yeah. So it's easy to sit there and tell somebody it's okay if this takes 90, 90 days, six months, because they should have a whole other list of a list of prospects to work on that maybe could turn on quicker than that one that they're after that they're getting frustrated with. Good deal. Um, last question I have, and I'll leave it up to you in terms of the depth that you want to go to. But to me, it, it is one of the most complex things, I think, as a seller within freight. So, you know, when I first transitioned over to the industry, I moved over from Tesla, totally different sales process and, and objective, right? Cause over there you sell a car and that's kind of the situation. And then here it's like you mentioned, right? You get onboarded, you move a shipment, but it takes time and it's the nurturing and the consistent account management growth and expansion piece that makes a big difference. But one of the things I've, I've always found just super interesting about freight is When you look at companies core values and what they preach about trust and transparency and like transparency is a core value among so many companies and whatnot i i i find it ironic and a little bit comical right because it's one of those industries where if you tell the truth you have high integrity like you can do well and but the tough part is is that it's so easy for anybody on the phone as a seller to say i'm very trustworthy i'm very transparent i'm going to provide the best levels of service and communication but you can't prove that right until you do it. That's the challenging part. How do you guys, and again, you can choose to go to the depths because I know that that's probably, you know, some internal stuff, but how do you guys navigate that part of trying to educate on the the how of how you guys actually have higher levels of service to differentiate yourselves? Um, First, do you drive a Tesla? I do. Oh man. On brand. Yeah. I, I, I look, man, I was in it, you know, I sold them for a year and a half, two years. And then I, I mean, I picked up, moved everything from Atlanta to Nashville for them. And I, I honestly expected to work for them for, for quite some time uh, until they just shook up a lot of things internally. But yeah, I'm a, I'm a big EV person and I'm still a big fan of the brand. Nice. Um, so one of the things I think that, and, and I think, I don't know. I'm assuming that most larger, you know, larger brokerages do it. And it might, this might be something that's a little harder for brokerages of a certain size to maybe follow through on or, or do. Um, but I think that it's really, you know, it's just, it, I think sales, I think customer service, I think in this industry is very similar to leadership. And so you, it's easy to lead when things are easy, when things are going good, dude, it is easy to be a leader. Right. So mm-hmm. um, when it's the same thing in, in, in transportation, when things are going good, it's really easy to say, yeah, look how good my customer service is. Look how good my communication is. Look how, look at all those things that I'm good at because I'm making so much money and things are going so well. And so when we sell and we talk about stuff and we get those challenges, we get those objections, like we don't use brokers. Why would we sign up another broker? We didn't have a good experience with the last brokerage we used. Um, our response basically is, you know, you're using the wrong brokerage and and um, it's something we fight all the time. We tell we tell prospects that we fight this all the time. We fight that bias. We fight that that assumption or that that kind of name um, all the time in the industry. And the real big difference, you know, we have, we've got our core values too. I don't know that transparency is one. Oddly, uh, I, the number <laughs> one the number one is we always do what we say we're going to do always. Um, so I booked the load with you. I booked the load is booked. Um, and that doesn't mean that I'm going to come back to you with a different rate. It doesn't mean that I'm mm-hmm. going to nothing. The load's booked. Um, but it also goes so far as to say, like, we're going to be financially accountable to you. And so what we are good at, what, what I think GX is, you know, I think there's something that every every company in their industry that they're the absolute best at. They might not even know what it is, but they, mm-hmm. in some way, they figured out a way to be the best at it. Um, I think GIX is the best in the industry at being there when things don't go to plan. When we mess up, 
when our carrier messes up, when when something doesn't go to plan, we don't shy away from the phone call. We don't shy away from the email. We don't shy away from the financial um, burden or requirement that might come with that. We don't, we don't, we miss a PO. We're sending the truck in and we'll have the PO picked up as soon as possible. I'm not going to sit there and split hairs about whether the ship did the carrier, did the driver hand both pieces of paperwork? Did the carrier check in right? Did the, did the shipper read the bills wrong? Like it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. We'll get, we'll get it repowered. Um, a claim happens, um, you know, fraud is, fraud is rampant when something fraudulent happens. Um, you just have to be there. And, and the, the, some of our best relationships with our customers are not because of how good our service is. It's because of how we stepped up in a difficult situation. The, the thing that would lose maybe another brokerage, the account is what has strengthened the relationship with the account for GIX because we chose not to, my lights just went off again. They chose not to, um, they, they liked how we responded. They liked that we put a plan of action together. They liked that we had a solution put in place before they had to beg. They liked that we answered the phone. They liked that our after hours group stepped up. They like all those things. Um, and, and they loved, they liked it all while the worst stuff was happening. And so I think that's, that's the big, so how do you convince somebody of that? I think you tell them, I think that that's, you know, some transportation managers, load procurement guys, folks, they, they love seeing if you can do it. You like, they like, I bet they can't, I, you know, right. like I, we've, we've had it. Like we've had people tell us like, yeah, you said all this stuff to us. And then this happened and we didn't think that it, you would actually do what you've explained to us that you would do. And they're like, you did. And, mm -hmm. and we usually get more business and, and have a better relationship because of it. And so, I, you know, the, the second part to that, or maybe, maybe even the most important part of that is, it's like, we, do you sound, do you sound, do you, can you come across as sincere? And, and I said this face to face with several customers that we're doing business with right now that we weren't doing business before, before that meeting. And I just said, everybody's going to tell you this. Every broker is going to sit down in front of you and say, we never give a load back. We, 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 we yada, 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 everything that we all say. And the difference is that GX actually does it. That's the difference. And you don't know that. And I've said that you don't, I will tell a prospect, you'll never know this until you give us a load to test it on, Correct. but just know that we, this is how we operate. This is how we've grown. How do you explain 7 million to 150 if we're out there burning bridges and not doing what we say we're going to do? That's a great how do you, point. How do you explain that? And um, you just can't, you can't, you can't have the type of growth that, that um, GIX and several other, there are other brokerages out there that operate the same way that we do. There mm -hmm. are several brokerages out there that, that are good, solid, transparent brokerages um, that will, that will do the same thing. And they've obviously probably also grown in the same manner over the same time period. Um, you just don't get to achieve that type of growth by, you know, basically pissing people off at, at every turn because something didn't go your way. That's great stuff, man. Last question for you, if you can sum it up in a minute. GIX Logistics is partners with Sales Dash for CRM. How would you guys describe your experience in using Sales Dash? Uh, it's been amazing. I, my sales reps love it. Um, honestly, for anybody that's watching or listening this, the best part of Sales Dash is Josh and the fact that you get to you get a response from a customer service rep that is the owner. Um, and I don't know how long that will last, Josh. I don't know from a growth standpoint, but for right now. Mm -hmm. That's the, that's one of the biggest takeaways. And it's not just, it's not, it, there has been no problems. There's been questions. There's been, um, requests that we've made. And, and I, I just, you know, I'm always kind of sending you a message. It seems like every maybe two times a month where it's like, Hey, could it do this? Or can we do yeah. this? Can we do that? <laughs> and the wonderful part about those emails is that it's always a response from you, the owner that can put it on a list and handle however you guys handle it internally. And hopefully we, we see those things, we see those things added, uh, or, or some, something similar. Um, but, um, it is just so far and away better than the, the previous, previous tools that we used. Um, I love that it is, uh, I love that it is transport has a transportation lean. Uh, we haven't even got into the carrier side yet. I got to get my, 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 um, off support team on it and get, get going on the carrier side. So, it's just a really tremendous product that is kind of catered to exactly what we need as a brokerage. And 
um, and what my team needs. And um, it's like, it feels like it's one of those pieces of tech that you get to use that you like, you get to use every feature, right? There's not some far flung feature that's out there. That's like, that's great. Uh, and I'm so glad that I'm paying for that, but I'll never use it. There right. is none of that. Um, that I think is what is, what is really cool about the product is like everything that we're paying for is, is, is what we're using. And, um, that's pretty cool. Very cool. I really appreciate that. Uh, that answer. And that's really good to hear about the features because normally when we're demoing and meeting with I mean, others, they'll normally say, that doesn't mean don't implement the stuff I've suggested. Right. <laughs> we will. No, it's all in no, consideration. I, I, no, you guys have been great. It's been an absolute, you know, it, I think we always talk so much about service in our industry from a brokerage standpoint to a, from a, to a customer and, mm -hmm. and what was, what I think is now starting to be refound again in our industry is the tech side and the customer service side that, that the new, the new, the new breed or the new blood of these, te of these tech providers that are coming into our industry and the customer service that they provide mm -hmm. is changing the expectation of companies like ours on what we should expect from our other providers that are out there that we maybe have always used or have consistently used. I won't mention any names because they're big right. names, but from a customer service standpoint, they really are lacking compared to some of the kind of tech startup, newer tech providers that are out there in our industry because the customer service is not even remotely comparable. It's not even comparable. So that's just been a great, that's been one of our biggest pieces of it. So that's to you, that's to your team. Uh, your product's great. The, the support of the product is, is just as great. Appreciate that feedback. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's honestly one of the biggest things that, I mean, I think we pride ourselves in and, and for me as the founder, it, it starts with me more than anything else, but it's definitely trickles down. It's just like it would in brokerage, right? If the, if the leader of the team, uh, if you see those actions from them, I think you see that among the rest of the team members, cause you lead by example on those fronts. So I think that's what my team does really well as they respond to that. When there are bugs, there are issues, or, you know, if we are looking to develop something and when the urgency is needed, you know, we're always going to, we're always going to press it where, where needed. But I think the biggest thing that I've taken from freight also, you know, from being not in the automotive space and just sales and customer service in general is responsiveness is super important. And sometimes even if you don't have the answer right then and there, you don't fully know, still giving somebody a response in a timely manner. Um, and just the acknowledgement puts people at ease. And a lot of the times people just want to be heard. And I hear the stories all the time about having to submit a ticket request, having to get a FAQ link or stuff like that. Um, and that's where you lose customers. It doesn't really matter how big you are. Um, and I think one of the things as a debate of the small guys versus the the big guys as, as companies and whatnot. Um, that's the advantage I think for the smaller ones is those are the areas that you can win. And there's going to be certain people that work with you strictly because of that, because they want to be able to get a human on the phone, you know, and those sorts of different things. So um, no, I appreciate that feedback and uh, insight, but yeah, the partnerships been awesome. I feel like it's just getting started. We've got a long way to go going to get you guys in on the carrier side. We still have more work to do on the carrier side. So we're, we're excited to continue to grow that and, you know, market it a little bit more, continue to fine tune some of the areas that we know that it can keep strengthening, but it's been a fun conversation, uh, yeah, learning more you. about, about your journey over there and excited to have more of these conversations and, and talk more sales. So thanks for taking the time to educate some people about the journey that you guys have had from six to 150 million. And who knows next time we talk what that, what that number is going to look like. Yeah. Hopefully, hopefully uh, <laughs> we can shake 2024 off and we can get, we can go. Yeah. Yeah. We're making it through Mike. Really appreciate the time. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks, Josh.